Angie's List is now Angie, A-N-G-I, and caring for your home just got easier. Whether you need help with routine maintenance or a dream remodel, Angie makes it easy to see reviews, compare quotes, and connect with top local pros who can get the job done right. Plus, you could see upfront pricing and instantly book hundreds of projects. No phone tag, just the work you need done at a time that works for you. Angie's got your to-do list covered from start to finish. Book your next home project today at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. Check out the latest footwear innovation from Adidas, the Adi Zero Adios Pro 2, which features carbon fiber energy rods that are both lightweight and precisely tuned for a more anatomical transition. Everything from the ultra-light polyester upper to the re-sculpted midsole and the reinvented outsoles are designed for speed. Visit adidas.com to learn more today. Time now for the Danny Mac Show with BK, getting you inside the cards at St. Louis Sports on 101 ESPN. scoring position. Yachty doesn't go after the first pitch, but it skips away, and the Cardinals grab the lead. 3-1 is set to left center. (laughs) All the outfielders are just going to watch it go. Paul Goldschmidt has a two-home run day. It's 8-5. 3-2 last call for Milwaukee. Game over. The comeback is complete and official, and the win streak continues for the Cardinals. This has been... Remarkable. Welcome into the Danny Mac Show on a Friday as we get you set for baseball coming up later today. It's a doubleheader, the St. Louis Cardinals and the Chicago Cubs. How is this happening? How is this happening? So the Cardinals now with a 12-game winning streak. First win when trailing by three or more runs in the seventh inning or later. They had been 0-48 until yesterday. Fourth team since 1900 to overcome a defeat of five or more runs to extend a winning streak to 12 or more games. The last team was that remarkable 2002 team. And the Cardinals with the first four-game sweep against the Brewers since May 2nd of 2013. That was a four-gamer began then in Milwaukee. Remarkable. 12-game winning streak. It's rare anyway, and the Cardinals have a chance to set the all-time record today with 14 consecutive wins in St. Louis Cardinals history. And it all began with Adam Wainwright yesterday. Yeah, I mean, that's you know our team's feeling it right now. It's just really cool. They picked me up big time today. Goldie had some really good swings. We had some really good at-bats before Goldie, and I gave him a big old smooch on the top of his head and don't care who knows it. It was a great team win. I mean, that put us in a hole, and they came back and won that game. Just just really good, really, really good against tough pitching. So it was cool. That was awesome. That was fun to be a part of. So Wayno yesterday, four innings, four hits, five earned, walked a pair. I thought the strike zone was a little tight yesterday for Adam Wainwright, and he struck out. Uh, just one. That one was his 2,000th strikeout. The Cardinals went down four to nothing in the bottom of the first after a grand slam that you heard from Tyrone Taylor. They were down five nothing. Taylor again a solo shot in the bottom of the fourth. Cardinals though respond with eight unanswered. Goldie continues his tear yesterday. Hits a couple of home runs, including the game-tying home run in the seventh. It was their first win all season when they trailed by three or more runs in the seventh inning or later. So the heart of the order really has been on fire uh, for the St. Louis Cardinals. Paul Goldschmidt here in the month of September is hitting 329, seven home runs. O'Neal slugging over 1,000, uh, uh, slugging 659, OPS of over 1,000, eight home runs. He's driven in 20. What about Nolan Arenado? 263 the average, seven home runs, 19 RBIs, but nine extra base hits. So what is he seeing right now from Goldie O'Neill Arenado, the manager, Mike Schilt? Uh Just quality of bats. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're tough guys to pitch to. You know, you got to – they don't – you know, they work their walks. T.O.'s taking some walks. No one took his walk today. Goldie's, you know, doesn't expand the zone a whole lot. Big, strong guy. He launched one way deep yesterday and 
got into two more today. Um, huge ones, you know, obviously the one to tie it and the one for insurance in the night. Not try to do too much, big strong, and just staying on the ball through the ball. One of the things that I want to get into, too, uh, going back to Adam Wainwright for just a moment, he had strikeout number 2,000 in his career yesterday. So he does get that elusive st- uh, strikeout. Luis Urias was the uh, 2,000th strikeout for Adam Wainwright. So he is the 86th pitcher. I mean, think of all the guys that have played baseball, all the pitchers that we've had in this game. He is the 86th pitcher in Major League history with 2,000 strikeouts and ninth ever with 2,000 strikeouts and only to do it with one team. And only he and Bob Gibson have done that in St. Louis Cardinals history. So pretty remarkable of what he was able to do. Now, as the team looking forward uh, is playing, they've got the Chicago Cubs coming up today. It's a doubleheader. And Wayno says that right now this team is just on fire and playing with confidence. Well, it's it's hard to stop a, when you got a mojo like that. Uh, earlier in the year when we got down one or two runs, you could feel kind of the air leave out of the building and everybody was like oh man yeah this is gonna be really tough but now it's um, you know we get down lately we hadn't been down a whole lot um but if we get down our guys are seemingly just real comfortable up there and they i mean it's, it's definitely a vibe of you know when goldie came up that in that spot even when tommy came up earlier in the game it was kind of like we're about to tie this game right here like this game is not over and it's just um, that's a good 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 feeling to have right before the postseason too is when teams start, you know, clicking like that. That's, that's that can be real fun. So that's Adam Wainwright, and the Cardinals have won 12 straight. So last time that it happened, 1982. Last time that it happened, featured a lineup in an infield that had Tommy Hur, Keith Hernandez, Ken Oberkfell, Ozzie Smith, Lonnie Smith was in that lineup. Uh, this is the first time <clears throat> the Cardinals have swept the four gamers we mentioned in Milwaukee since 2013 and the first team since the uh, uh, Astros in 1999 to win uh, 12 straight in September. That is tough to do because so many teams uh, are fighting for their playoff lives, certainly in the Cardinals case. So now it's just uh, a handful of games to go. They've got a lead. Adam Wainwright back to 2000. Why did it take so long? Yeah, unlike last time today, I knew I needed just one and I was trying not to let that affect pitch count or a, 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 a pitch selection or and, you know still throw the right pitches in the right situ- situations I mean there was there was I don't know how many just barely foul tips that the guys had but it's that's probably just a little bit of late life not on the end of the pitch just you know just being an honest uh, critique of my of my own game and uh, or, or or it's or it's the other teams going I'm not going to be 2000 you know and that there might have had a, a little bit of that too that's an interesting point, but what does it mean for him to get to that elusive 2,000? Now, again, he and only Bob Gibson, the only ones in Cardinals history that have done that. I mean, it's a good starting point. It's not where I'm going to end up. It's not it, that two, pitching 200 innings has always been sort of something that just comes as a byproduct of pitching 32 games to me. I mean, I, it's not a, it's not a uh, like, oh, man, I really nailed it there. I pitched two in, 200 innings, but it is a cool number. It is a cool number. Um, to be able to say you pitched 200 innings. That means you carried your team deep into the game a lot of times and gave your, t- gave your team and yourself a chance to win. And, and uh, that's really what starting pitching is all about, isn't it? And um, it's not the <clears throat> end-all, be-all by any, ch- by any stretch, but uh, it is a cool number. It is. There's no doubt about it. Well, to me, that is a really significant number. When you think about coming off a truncated season, the fact that he's 40, the fact that you needed to find yourself – innings out of this rotation and where were they going to come from well it comes from adam wainwright it's a lot of punch outs you know and it's it's a it's an impressive number you know it speaks to a lot of things obviously duration it speaks to you gotta have a strikeout pitch or pitch is and he's he's got them you know he's got the signature curveball um but he's got other weapons as well so you know it's a tremendous accomplishment and, and hats off to adam for another tremendous milestone he's reaching his career pretty amazing to see him get to uh, 2,000 strikeouts in one game and also 200 innings in the same game. So now the Cardinals will take on the Chicago Cubs. And you're going to have Jack Flaherty going in game number two. You got Jay Happ going in uh, the first game. So the Cardinals get a little bounce, I'm sure, from Flaherty coming back in game number two. You got Happ going in game number one. And it's the Cardinals and the Cubs. It's a doubleheader. 
from Wrigley Field and a four-game series and a chance to match uh, 14 consecutive wins, which was set by the 1935 was it 32, Tanner? It was 32, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 32 club. I'm feeling good about it today, Dan. Are you? I'm calling... Well, actually, I don't want to call it. I don't want to TKO it. But I'm feeling good about them getting to this 14-game winning streak. I mean, they're playing... Every, everything's clicking right now. Pitching's pitching well. The bullpen's been good. Jack Flaherty's return, you mentioned, it's going to add a little bit of a boost probably to the Cardinals. Like they needed a boost, but it's going to be great to get him back. We don't know. There's a chance we could see Dakota Hudson possibly return. Uh, which I, I hope he does. I'm hoping to see maybe them piggyback Hudson with Flaherty. But I do feel like we're going to see 14-game winning streak here today. Really? I'm feeling I'm feeling good about it. This is the best I've felt about Cardinals baseball since maybe that 2011 run. And yeah. there's been good teams in between. 2015 was really good. They got to 100 wins, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. But this, this team, just something has clicked. I'm not sure what it is, but, I mean, it's not just... One thing is clicked. Everything's clicked. The offense, the pitching, the defense, it's all coming together at the right time. I think they're going to hit the 14-game winning streak today. So did you think they were coming back yesterday? I mean, that that is a defining win in this winning streak. Now, they've had a bunch of really good moments. I mean, it all began on September 11th in a comeback win against Cincinnati. But then you had the, the games against the Mets that were really good games, especially that uh, game that went into extra innings. Um but I'm not sure during this run there's been a better one than the one that we saw yesterday. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't expect to come back. Maybe at four nothing in the first, I thought it. But after that other that solo home run by Taylor again, his second, that made it five nothing. And then they, they think they pulled Wayno after that. Uh, they pinch it for him in the fourth, and then KK comes in in the fifth. I went, eh, this, you know, it's probably not their day. Five nothing. Maybe the offense just has a quiet one. And then when it got to five one, I thought, eh, maybe. But, but then I think it really started to sit in when the seventh, when the Brewers started having the walking issues. I went, all right, they're actually going to do this. And then that Goldie home run was just amazing. It was amazing. And the other thing too, when they threw the ball away, I mean, that's something that is happened with Milwaukee in this series that they just completed with the Cardinals. That was kind of like the door was opened at that point. When they threw the ball away a little bit, you thought, okay, maybe this has got a, a shot. It would just it just opened the door a little bit, and it gave you enough to get to Goldie, and then he hits the home run. And once he hit the home run and they tied it, I thought, they're going to win this game. I really did. I felt like they are going to win this game, which is uh, completely the opposite of how I felt probably even a month ago, that if they were having those late-inning games that were tight, I was like, there's no way. But the bullpen has changed that to where it keeps you in the games and you feel like you're going to win. And the big thing for me, too, is we talked all yesterday about Tyler O'Neill. The last two days we talked about how great Tyler O'Neill's had and how great his season has been. Tyler O'Neill yesterday was 0 for 5 with three strikeouts. Right. And then you look at the Cardinals and they're able to come back. If you told me O'Neill's going to go 0 for 5 and have three strikeouts, I would have said, okay, coming back from down 5 nothing would have been pretty difficult for this team. But Goldie has a big day. One that went under the radar, Carlson, 3 for 4. He scored two runs, so he played really well yesterday as well. So it just shows you how much deeper this lineup has become with everybody clicking at the right time. And I want to go to Adam Wainwright. You mentioned we just talked about him getting the 200 innings this season. I think BK's brought this stat up to my attention before. How impressive is it that the Cardinals are going on this run when Adam Wainwright has thrown 200 innings and the next closest to him is KK at 103 and two-thirds? That's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. Not many teams would be able to survive that if they had that kind of pitching. That's That feels like the number of innings you'd see from a team like the Diamondbacks who are rebuilding and have 100-plus losses. The fact that the Cardinals are able to do that, let alone it's a 40-year-old pitcher that has the 200 innings, but only one guy... It, in the rest of the rotation, he's not even in the rotation anymore. Has 100 innings. It's really impressive for this Cardinals team to be on this run. That's amazing. The next closest active starter, uh, let's see. With Flaherty's return, if we want to consider him a starter, he'd be the next closest currently on the team with 76. After KK. After KK. Wow. Because Lester's at, oh, I don't have Lester's totals, but Lester's at 56 as a Cardinal. Right. And Hats at 43 and two thirds as a Cardinal. It's amazing. That's, that, a, that's, that's hard to believe. Yeah. yeah. Here's the other thing, Tanner, is that we've been saying that the Cardinals <clears throat> would have to get, or at least the second wild card team is going to have to get to, let's say, 88, 89 wins. They got a good shot to do it. They got a good shot to be a 91 team. Yes. I would have never have thought that. What They're sitting at what? Are they at now? 80, they're at 83 right now with 10 to go. Right. And I would suspect... And I would think that they can at least take three or four from the Cubs. So there's 87, another two or three, 89. And then you just got to find one more, and you figure that will come at least in that Brewer series at home. They may have a shot as is setting the bar at 
right at 90 seems pretty good. 7-3 seven and, seven and, seven and final three. 10. That seems very feasible, especially the way the Cubs are playing right now. They're not a very good team. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, all right, coming up, we're going to visit with Jim Hayes of Valley Sports Midwest and get you set for baseball coming up. It's a doubleheader at Wrigley Field in Chicago. Later in the show, we'll go around the major leagues, but uh, Jim Hayes is coming up next. Back to more of the Danny Mac Show with BK on 101 ESPN. Danny Mac show on a Friday as we get you set for baseball coming up today on Bally Sports, the Cubs and the Cardinals, and uh, the Cardinals are rolling to say the least. They have won 12 in a row, and part of the broadcast today will be, as always, uh, Jimmy the Cat Hayes. You know, Cat, they've been asking for you on the text line to be more a part of the show, so I figured this is the perfect time to get you. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. There's no accounting for taste, uh, Danny, but... Uh... When you say the Cardinals are rolling, uh, I like to say they are hashtag soaring. Yeah, you do. Uh, I see it all the time on social media. Um, what, what, what would you say is the reason as to why this has happened for the Cardinals? If somebody came up to you on the street and said, Jim, how has this happened? What, what would be your response? Well, I mean, you could look at what they're doing, and they're winning games by jumping on other teams, or they're winning games by answering uh, with eight runs i mean they're 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 clicking on on all cylinders no question about it i think they put pressure on the other team i think they've done that for the other teams um in the in the wild card chase if you can call it that uh for some time because first of all they they play better defense than anyone that puts pressure on the other team um they have so much speed when guys get on base or a guy like baiters at the plate or tommy edmund i think teams tighten up defensively because they know the speed. I, I think that's a big factor. They've been getting great starting pitching. The bullpen has been excellent as well. They're doing it, um, you know, pretty much at every level. When you talk to Mike Schilt about it, he kind of bristles, Danny, and it's kind of interesting because, as you know, Schilt is a guy who likes his team and he's, he's proud of, of his ball club. And if you ask him, he will tell you, well, it's been in there the whole time. You know, we've been telling you that. And he points to the fact that they were playing really well early, so it's not like they haven't played very good baseball. Then the uh, the starting rotation takes some hits with injuries, including Flaherty. They came back down to earth, and then they built back up. So I just think I think they're playing like a, a team that's talented, which they have been. And I, I, I agree with Schilt that that talent has been there all along for whatever reason. It's just coming to the forefront now. And now you get Jack Flaherty returning today. What do you, what do you think that does for the club? Listen, he's a really popular guy on that ball club because he's a good teammate. And he said all the right things along the way. The Cardinals obviously are keeping an eye on next season for Jack. They don't want to push him too hard. And uh, he, I expect him to go like he did in his mini sim, uh, 15, 18 pitches, maybe two innings. But I think just by getting him out there and seeing what he can do and being very, very careful with him, that will give the, the team a big lift. And as you know, they, uh, they took Dakota Hudson off his rehab start Wednesday night from Memphis so that he could factor in and, He's a guy that's not totally stretched out, but he's been going four or five innings in his rehab start. So um, if they choose to do that, he can help them. And I, I think they've done a good job of piecing together um, some decent arms. Hap goes in game one, um, but piecing together some good arms for, uh, you know, the doubleheader, two seven-inning games, they'll be all right. You, you've had some interesting conversations that I think uh, people would enjoy with John Lester um, you know, from the outside looking in, when he was with Boston or with the Cubs, certainly we saw him a bunch, and he kind of mean mugs the umpire. Still doing that. Uh, he, he, you know, Mike Schilder said he's like John Wayne out there, but yet I watch your interviews with him. He's really thoughtful, and and you know, I, I like I just enjoy the interviews. Um, how would you describe those? If if you know if. If you could describe what it's been like to visit with, with John Lester, what has that been like? Well, you know, he was buddies with Lackey, who was here, and Lackey kind of intimidated everyone. And when you sat him down, you were like, oh, this guy's an interesting guy. It's yeah. been the same way with with uh, Lester. <clears throat> and I think when a guy has been at the top of his game and then fell down a little, I do think that 
that kind of adds a new dimension to them in, in terms of being humble and maybe being open to questions. I, I never talked to him when he was at the, the peak, um, but he's been great as a Cardinal, and he's really, a, as you point out, a really thoughtful, smart guy. And the reason he says he's being successful now is he had to stop being stubborn and stop thinking, well, I'm still the same guy. I can bust everyone up and in with my fastball. He said, I can't do that anymore, so now I have to depend on uh, – on my command. And he said, it's not an easy thing to do because you're, you're learning a whole new system. He credits Yachty and Mike Maddox and Wayno for helping him figure out how to, how to be the guy that he is now. And he's been really, really good. And one of the things that was interesting in our discussion the other day, and I think he mentioned it briefly in his zoom, you know, he's proud of getting 200 wins. And he was saying, you know, that he kind of thinks that stat of a win has been thrown by the wayside by new age stat guys. And he said, I think as a stat, it's still valuable. He said, they still determine, you know, who advances in the playoffs and, and, you know, by number of wins. And he said, he thinks part of it is so that uh, organizations don't have to overpay (laughs) pitchers who accumulate a lot of wins with a lot of money by saying that's not that important of a stat. He said he gets, he gets the other side. Why, you know, certain guys who pitch very well on teams that aren't good don't get the same amount of wins, but he still values that as a stat, and he said he thinks it's kind of losing its value. Jim Hayes of uh, Bally Sports is our guest. We saw Wayno kind of have one of his shorter outings yesterday, but he picked up his 2,000th strikeout. This has been an amazing run for him, hasn't it? It's been unbelievable, Danny, when you think back to the years where he was hurt and you thought, boy, you know, this might be the end of the road for Wayno. We've seen that a couple of times. And then you talk to Wayno after the game, and it seems like that thought was crossing his mind as well. But he said all along, you know, if he could just get back to being healthy. And as you point out on the broadcast, Danny, when he's healthy, everyone talks about the curveball, and there's no question that's his bread and butter. But when he's healthy and can spot his fastball at 90 miles an hour, Wayno says that's the difference for him because guys can't sit on the breaking stuff. And he's healthy now. He's spotting fastballs. And, of course, he always has, you know, the 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 curveball to, to get him out of trouble. And I think yesterday what we saw was a really, really small strike zone. And, I, you know, what Wayno's so good at adapting, and he got jumped on a little bit early. That, but that's kind of a rarity because what he has been is just a model of consistency. I know you know Tyler O'Neill fairly well. Um, I think – I don't know if this surprises a lot of people. Um, probably not the Cardinals. I mean, they've been waiting for this to happen. But how do you evaluate what uh, what you've seen this year out of Tyler O'Neill? He's been great, and I think I think we're really only seeing him scratch the surface because, as you guys always point out, you know the the defense. I mean, he did want a Gold Glove, but we haven't really seen him utilize his speed as much on the base paths. But to get a player that can play defense can hit, he's hitting for average now, can drive the ball. I mean, everything he hits is a a torpedo. Um, He's really been unbelievable, and he's really a different kind of personality. (laughs) You know, I mean, Danny, I'll give you an example. One time uh, this season, I noticed on a on a Zoom interview post game, we weren't on site, and uh, he was we had a big game, so we we interviewed him on the field after, and I noticed he was bleeding because of a slide that he made, and I said, "Okay, Tyler, thanks for the time to go clean up that blood. You got to clean that up." And he said, "Glad to bleed for the boys anytime, Jim." <laughs> I mean, he's a unique personality. He's really a nice guy, and he is a, a crazy talented uh, outfielder. And like you guys always point out, I think the reason why I say he may just be scratching the surface is he's got such a, a quick swing. He's got a quick bat. And I think that will will serve him as pitchers try to adjust and, um, and you know, make their adjustments to try to maybe attack him a little differently. I think he'll be fine because it, it's a pretty short stroke for a guy who drives the ball the way he does. And the, and the speed of the bat is really impressive. I, I have found the, uh, the post game, Zoom sessions with Mike Schilt to be uh, interesting in this regard. I, I think fans, when the team was struggling, it was like they wanted him to, you know, flip over the spread and go crazy. And he he's just not going to do that, Jim. You know him. He's uber <clears throat> positive. I think at times that has frustrated fans, but ultimately it probably has won his team over again this year by just kind of staying even keel. Would you agree with that? 
Players love him, Danny. You know that. They absolutely love him. And you know what? You know what he does to me? I've watched him and I'm thinking, I, this is a leader. And you know, there are times where um, I think fans get fed up when they weren't playing well. And he says, you know, some of the same things. Here's the thing, Danny. He's not going to throw his team under the bus. He throws himself under the bus. You know, he'll defend them or throw out some of his cliches knowing, guess what? He's going to be the one picking heat for saying that. Yeah. But it's by design. He's shielding his players. The players appreciate that. And to me, that's leadership. You know, he is not going to blow up anyone on his team because he's angry, which he gets. You know, he's a fiery guy. We've seen it on the field. Um, but he's not going to torch anyone on his ball club, not the kind of guy he is and not the kind of leader. And I think there's something admirable about that. When times are tough, he's not a guy that's going to point the finger. You know, he's not going to point it at himself, but he's going to say things knowing that that some of the animosity is going to be directed at him. And he's like, that's fine. That's part of the job. I, I got to tell you, I, if I'm in the front office, uh, I'm smiling a little bit today. And the fact that I went out and got Wade LeBlanc and TJ McFarland and Luis Garcia and Jay Happ and John Lester, and lo and behold, it, it worked. I mean, they've taken a lot of heat over, you know, a Rosa Reina, a Dolis Garcia, even Luke Voigt to an extent, even though you got a closer out of it in Gallegos. Um, but uh, there's got to be satisfaction in, in certain corners of that front office and saying, you know what, maybe we did do some right things here and, and prove some people wrong. Well, they, they stabilized the bullpen and they stabilized the starting rotation, which were two giant needs. And if you trace back the turnaround, probably to that, they brought in guys who could pitch and throw strikes, which was something that the Cardinals pitching staff wasn't doing. And Danny, I said this on Twitter, you know, like <clears throat> you have to give the Cardinals front office credit for making those moves to stabilize rotation and bullpen. Even when they made those moves, I didn't think that would do it. I'll be honest. I had to say these pitchers that you just mentioned, Danny, have exceeded, I think, all the fans' expectations because I know they exceeded mine. These guys have been much better than I thought, and I'm not afraid to admit that, but you got to give credit where it's due. Yeah, and I'm shocked, to be quite honest with you. I, and remember at the time when they got Happ and Lester, in my mind, I don't know if you agree with this, it was more just to kind of stabilize the season and get through it because you didn't want to uh, rush Oviedo, maybe even Jake Woodford at that point in time, who was not pitching all that well. Uh, it was more about just kind of stabilize the season, get through it so we don't have to rush some of the young guys. But now with the additions, they're, they're just different pitchers. You know, so Jay Happ, you're going to see fly balls. Well, pitch him at home, you know, because uh, <clears throat> Bush Stadium plays big. John Lester, uh, we were talking about him earlier, but he's he's kind of redefined how he's pitching. So to their credit, they made those adjustments. I think you, you nailed it when you said the Cardinals were, uh, my impression was get through it, meaning they brought in arms, veteran guys who know how to pitch, don't know what the results are going to be, but we don't want to tap into certain resources at this point. These guys will get us to the finish line. But, uh, uh, you know, I, so I agree. I, it seemed like it was a move just to get through it. But these guys have been better than advertised. You know, and if you talk to Hap, whose stuff has been good, I mean, the life on the fastball, he's got movement. Um, he said one of the things that turned it around for him is working with Maddox and Yachty about pitch sequencing. He said my stuff was pretty good. I just wasn't rolling it out correctly and he's kind of changed some things in what he throws in what situations and it's worked beautifully for him I mean I, I don't think anyone could have looked at the moves that those guys made you know it started with LeBlanc and thought yeah th th this is going to turn everything yeah, right. around and 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 those weren't the moves by themselves that turned it around but as you said it stabilized things took some of the heat off so that the Cardinals were able to start clicking on other levels as well Nolan Arenado uh, has been, in my mind, everything that the Cardinals could have hoped for. Goldschmidt is turning into, again, an MVP candidate. By You know, you take away the first 30, 45 days, he's been amazing. It, it, you know, those two guys, Jimmy, anchoring your lineup, and then the move by Schilt to go Edmund at the top, Goldie, O'Neal, Arenado, uh, that shouldn't be overlooked either because that those four starting the game, and as you talked about, they've jumped out to early leads – 
that's been a huge difference for this team. Yeah, I, I, if I were another team, I, I wouldn't want to face the Cardinals with that lineup. You know, there were stretches, Danny, where we didn't see Goldie or, or Nolan hit together. Now they are, and we're seeing what it's like when you throw in guys like O'Neal, Edmund, Carlson. That's a very dangerous lineup. It's kind of what we thought. I know, I know you thought that. I did, too, that we thought this lineup could potentially be from the start. Now it's emerging. And, and what Goldschmidt is doing I mean, he broke the Brewers, Danny. You know, the Brewers were, were you know, out of touch, out of reach. They were so far ahead. And I think during this series, look, it's, it's just one series. But I think the Cardinals kind of exposed the Brewers where those flaws are. And I think that that changes the view of a lot of teams. And, and Goldie was the one that broke the Brewers. Well, and they did it against three of their four best pitchers. That's what... Yep. You know, to, the Brewers are built on their pitching. They're starters and then bridge the gap somehow to get to Williams and Hayter. Uh, even, you know, Boxberger has been really good for them. Obviously struggled yesterday. But if I'm a Brewers fan, I wake up this morning, There, there's, I think, a little – there's a there's a red flag right now uh, with the way that that series unfolded. I, I You have to, right? No, there's no question. I mean – I think the Cardinals figured out how you can get to some of the starters. I think defensively, um, the Brewers can't match what the Cardinals do. And, again, you get some guys on base with the speed. You know, the Brewers are going to throw the ball around a little. I just think some of the, the flaws were exposed. And I know Yelich did make a nice defensive play yesterday, but that's a guy who's just not the same guy. No. And I, I just don't think they're the same lineup unless Yelich is Yelich because – there's some good players on there, but I don't think they're going to scare a pitching staff. All right, Jimmy, we got a doubleheader today on uh, Bally Sports pregame and post games for both games. Uh, what do you have planned coming up uh, for the uh, the first game, Danny? As w- when something is TBD, you say we're working on something big. But uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll have a pregame interview. I can promise your listeners this, Danny. Once again, because I've been doing it for twenty years, my plan is to ride your coattails. By the way, you are killing it on the play-by-play this year, and it's fun to see and fun to watch and fun to be part of. Dan. Well, you've done a hell of a job with the uh, the, the fact that we're not there and uh, trying to do your job, which is not easy. So it's been fun, always fun with you, and uh, we'll catch up this afternoon. Thanks for doing this. See you, Danny. All right, buddy. That's uh, Jim Hayes of Valley Sports, and this is 101 ESPN. We'll go around the major leagues when we come back. Can't get enough cards talk? You've come to the right place. Back to more of the Danny Mac Show with BK on 101 ESPN. Around the major leagues we go. That's Tanner Hendrickson. I'm Dan McLaughlin. Don't forget uh, that coming up it'll be BK and Alex Ferrario. They'll have you for uh, three hours coming up after this program. And we have a doubleheader, both games on Valley Sports, the Cardinals, and the Chicago Cubs. I, um, I am curious what you think of this, Tanner. So Major League Baseball to experiment with pre-tacked baseballs in some AAA games, according to the uh, AP, this came out late last night. Um, you know, they're, they're doing it, and I think it's in the KBO, and also in the Japanese leagues, there is the tacky baseballs that they use. And a lot of players have pointed that and said, especially those that have been over there and played and said, why can't we get that here? Then all of a sudden, the sticky substances and the things that we worry about, that's over. Potentially. I think they'll still check, but... Um, I think it's a good thing. I mean, you're, you're doing everything else with larger bases, limiting the shift, electronic strike zone in some of the areas of, of, of rookie ball. You might as well just try this. I mean, it's only a week. Why not do it? Yeah, I, I'm a little surprised that they decided to do it in the final week of AAA because I know that they had talked about experimenting with it down in the, I believe it was, was it the Atlantic League that they have or the Independent League that they uh, you usually send some of these experiments to. I, I think it is good, though, that they are going to experiment with it. I kind of wonder if they're going to do it for all of next season, too, because it's going to be hard to tell in just a week. You'll get an idea of what the players think of it and stuff. But I agree. I, I think you have to have proof that it works. Yeah. Like, you've you got to have some analytical studies that make sure spin rates don't go crazy exactly. like we had been seeing yeah it, it, it's interesting and i'm 
uh, my biggest shock was just that it came with the final week to go in AAA season and they're getting ready for their playoffs and stuff. But I think it's a good thing to do. I know players had always complained about it, and I know that they tried it in the past and it just didn't work out. And like you mentioned, the KBO and the Japanese League, they do it, so why can't Major League Baseball as well? For the first time since 2008, the White Sox are the AL Central champs. In the air again, right field. Zimmer is back at the track. Oh, he did it again. Tim Anderson wants to do it all by his lonesome. And the Sox are pouring it on on what looks more and more like clinch day. Hendricks got him. And for the first time since 2008, Sox fans will see home playoff baseball. The Chicago White Sox are winners of the AL Central. The game one victory, by the way, gives Tony La Russa, I love this, his 13th division title as a manager, his first since 09 with the Cardinals. La Russa's initial division championship came in 1983 with the White Sox, wow. who finished 99-63 and 63 to claim the AL West crown at that time in 1983. Tony has won six pennants, three World Series titles, and uh, obviously looking to pad that remarkable resume that has already taken him to the Hall of Fame and then back out of the Hall of Fame. Well, he's still in the Hall of Fame, but back into baseball. But uh, remarkable. It all began in 1983 with the White Sox, and it's come full circle, and he's guided them again to postseason play. And you think about um, the initial hiring of Tony LaRusso and how frustrated a lot of people were. He, he knew he had a good club. This wasn't like a rebuild, obviously. He had good players, but he put them in positions to win, and that's what Tony does. Yeah, and there's and for all the backlash that came with the hiring, there's never really been a moment where you said, oh, this team's in danger of missing the playoffs. They've played pretty much consistent baseball for the whole year. Now, they did have that uh, DH uh, issue with that kid where he hit the home run where Tony gave him the take sign. But other than that, he's managed his team perfectly. To me, they're going to be the sleeper in the in the AL. I don't think a lot of people are going to take them. A lot of people are going to look at the Astros. We've got four juggernauts in the AL East that are trying to get into the playoffs. To me, they're that sleeper team that not only am I rooting for because they've got TLR managing them, but I think they're the team that could possibly even come out of the American League. So right now in the wild card situation, the Cardinals – uh, by the way, they're 14 and a half back of the Dodgers. Dodger, Dodgers are plus 14 and a half. Then you have the Cardinals. Then it's the Phillies, Cincinnati, San Diego. Uh, and let's get you caught up on what's happening with that. The Nationals help out St. Louis against Cincinnati. On a pitch away, Soto jacks one to left. See you later. He's done it again. He is amazing. And that is the one piece that remains for Uh, the Washington Nationals, and that is Juan Soto. Doesn't strike out, puts the ball in play, and hits for high average and hits for power. You know, they've had a really bad year for for them, Um, but he is, is he the best hitter in the league? I think so. I do too. He's unbelievable. His command for the strike zone, I think, what, 22 years old, if I'm not mistaken? It's phenomenal. So that puts Cincinnati now five and a half games back. The Reds have dropped 15 of their last 20 Three. How about the Phillies? They're hanging in there. Line drive out toward left field. Alford's going back. It's over his head, and it bounces out of the yard. It's a three-run home run for Ronald Torres. And for the fourth time this year, the Phillies have erased at least a six-run deficit. They've taken the lead. It's eight to six here in the bottom of the sixth inning. They have played well. They're seven and three in their last ten. The only problem is the Cardinals don't lose, so the Phillies are now four and a half games out. Meanwhile, the uh, the Padres they are six back, and then you have the Mets uh, ten out. National League West, the Padres they're trying to hang in there because they uh, took on the Giants yesterday and took them two extra innings. On the ground, up the middle, diving at second, Lestella the throw is late, and the Padres walk it off. In from third comes Profar. Victor Caratini sends a bounding ball back up the middle. Lestella comes home with it, but his throw off the mark, and the Padres win it. 
In 10 innings, a 7-6 victory for San Diego. So it keeps them alive. Also, it's a loss for the Giants because the Giants are still going back and forth with the Dodgers. The Dodgers fell behind in Colorado yesterday, but then could be the MVP. I don't think he will be, but he struck. Max swings, and he hits a high drive to center field. This ball's back. So the Giants hold a one-game uh, advantage over the Dodgers for the first spot in the National League West. Now another team we got to watch out for a little bit here. What's happening in the National League East? And that means the Atlanta Braves. Varsho belts it to center. Heredia broke in. And he won't get there. It's over his head. Calhoun coming around third. Varsho's at second. Diamondbacks have the lead. So if you look at what's happening here, the Phillies... Yes, they're four and a half games behind St. Louis. It, it may be very tough unless the Cardinals collapse here in the final 10 games to catch St. Louis. But they uh, are only back of the Braves by two in the uh, East. And so what you have here, too, is also in this final week, the Phillies and the Braves have a three-gamer. So that could be fun. That fi- I think it's the final weekend, too, Tanner, where those two teams will hook up and play each other for the potentially the National League East division. Yeah, that's going to be a heck of a series down the stretch. Yeah, they it's Phillies are in Atlanta for three. It's the second-to-last series, the final weekend here in September. So that is going to be a battle for the NL East. I, I want to go back to the NL West for just a second. Padre, or excuse me, the Giants hold a one-game lead over the L.A. Dodgers. And Rick Kummel wrote an interesting piece in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch yesterday talking about, you know, is it the best thing for the Cardinals if those two teams tie and have to play a game 163? The Dodgers, if I'm not mistaken, according to reports, are already starting to plan around Max Scherzer starting for the wild card game just in case they can't catch the division. But if it goes to a game 163, if you're the Dodgers and you're the Giants, are you throwing out your best guy if they're available, so Gossman versus Scherzer, so you don't have to go to a one-game playoff? Or do you not, just in case you lose, and that way you have your guy available to take on the Cardinals? i, I got to throw my best guy. Try and, and win the division. Yeah, I mean, because then at that point, in it, it, one game, winner take all, it's cliche, but it's true. Anything can happen. Yep. So i got to go with my best guy. What are you doing? I would go with my best guy, too, because, like you said, anything can happen in a one-game playoff. That's why, even though the Cardinals, you look at them, and they're, what did you mention, 14 games back or something of the L.A. Dodgers, the Cardinals are hot right now, and if I'm any team, I don't want to face them. But no. You mentioned the numbers in the first segment with the big three for the Cardinals, Arnado, O'Neal, Goldie. Goldie and O'Neal have OPSs so far in September above 1,000, and I believe Arnado's above 900. So if I'm one of those teams and we tie for a game 163, I'm starting my number two guy. So if I'm the Dodgers, I'm probably going to Urias or Kershaw. And then if I'm the Giants, I don't even know who you turn to. Di Sclafani, maybe? Maybe, yeah. So I I would rather, even though I want to win game 163, it's tough for me. I I still think you start your aces because you want to get into the NLDS, and that way you have a best of five to survive. But it's tough because if if you lose... Then you don't have your ace, and then it just depends. How do you feel about them going up against Adam Wainwright? Because that's the best thing for the Cardinals. Now that they've kind of opened up, I know they haven't won it yet, but the math's in their favor. They can play in for Adam Wainwright to start the NL wildcard game because they don't really have to worry about a game 163. Think about it, too. If you're the Dodgers, you can. <laughs> this is the uh, embarrassment of riches that they have. Okay, so you get Max Scherzer, and then, well, you can go Walker Buehler, or you go Clayton Kershaw. I mean, they, they've just uh, – Urias – I mean, they they are loaded where I think that gives them advantage in a five-game series over anybody else that they play. Their pitching is so deep. That's what's going to carry them potentially in these playoff matchups in these series. Uh, Looking at the American League wild card. So right now, if it ended today, uh, the Red Sox are in. The Yankees are in. Red Sox are up by two over New York. New York has a game advantage over uh, Toronto. How about the Mariners? They're only two games out. uh, And then Oakland now four games back. As we mentioned in the National League, so the Cardinals will start play today with a doubleheader. Four and a half in front of the Phillies. Five and a half in front of Cincinnati. And then uh, uh, San Diego is six back. The standings, when you start looking at what's uh, transpiring 
with all these different uh, divisions. We already know Tampa Bay has wrapped up the East. We mentioned the White Sox have wrapped up the Central. Houston has a seven-game lead over Seattle in the West. Atlanta, that's the one to watch. They're two in front of the Phillies. Milwaukee, seven and a half in front of St. Louis. Um, And the uh, Dodgers are just one game back in the West. Interesting, too, in that Milwaukee series, you know, their magic number was at three, and they did not wrap it up against the Cardinals. So did not get to celebrate in front of St. Louis. I kind of like that. I, yeah, I do, too. And, you know, you look at their schedule. They got the Mets this week this weekend, so I think they may reach their magic number of three there. But if not, I mean, it's a long shot for the Cardinals to catch the Brewers for the NL Central. Let, let's not kid ourselves. But then they have the Cardinals again here in St. Louis, and then they have the Dodgers to wrap up the year. So, their road's, their road's tough to get the final three. If they're going to be the ones to win to get the magic number of three, of course, it just takes any number of three, to, whether it be two wins for the Brewers, one loss for the Cardinals. But they've got a tough stretch of schedule coming, and they're not playing great baseball. I was not impressed with them in the four-game set, and you don't want to see a team like the Brewers taking their Well, we do, but if you're Milwaukee fans, you don't want to see the Brewers taking their foot off the pedal right around postseason time. Check out the latest footwear innovation from Adidas, the Adi Zero Adios Pro 2, which features carbon fiber energy rods that are both lightweight and precisely tuned for a more anatomical transition. Everything from the ultra light polyester upper to the re sculpted midsole and the reinvented outsoles are designed for speed. Visit adidas.com to learn more today. When you're sick, every minute counts. So don't go anywhere. Go to DispatchHealth.com where high-quality medical care comes directly to you. No getting out of a sick bed. No crazy driving to an emergency room. No endless paperwork. No hospital waiting rooms. Visit DispatchHealth.com to learn about our medical professionals, then make house calls. Dispatch Health is covered by Medicare and most major insurance. Go to DispatchHealth.com.